so last month I graduated from my masters and since I'll never be going back to university ever again I've been reflecting a lot on my university experience and the things I wish I had learnt prior to going to uni and just for context I did three years of international relations with anthropology in England, I also studied a year abroad in Australia and then I did a part-time masters in Scotland in international political theory and in many ways I thrived in university, I got the best grades, I went to Russell Group Universities which is equivalent to the Ivy League in the US. I don't mention these things to brag about my accomplishments as I'm going to go into later, I don't even think that grading or ranking should be a thing but I mentioned them because in many ways I should be singing the praises of university because the system worked for me, no one in my extended or immediate family had ever been to university before and I think a lot of the time criticism of something can hit a lot harder when it comes from someone that actively benefited from the system. So I want to talk today about some of the harmful, potentially dangerous elements of the education system that I wish I had known prior to coming to university and also offer up an alternative vision for what our education system could look like. I arrived at university bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, excited to learn, but it never failed to amaze me how much professors were so skilled at making the most interesting topic so utterly dull. The standard way that a lecture works is you have a professor who stands before you, monologuing at you in a dry tone for hours on end, making it hard not to fall asleep. It wasn't uncommon to hear someone start to snore in a lecture like it was the place that they came for their afternoon nap. Virginia Woolf wrote in 1934 about the painful experience of attending a lecture. Now the human voice is an instrument of varied power. It can enchant and it can soothe. It can rage and it can despair. But when it lectures, it almost always bores. When you're not in lectures, you're expected to fill your time by reading academic articles, the majority of which are written in inaccessible language filled with jargon, making it difficult to understand what the hell they're talking about, let alone be passionate about it. I can't tell you how many times I would read an academic article, be laboring over it for hours on end, only to discover at the end that any Tom, Dick or Harry from down the road could have said the same thing in one sentence. But Burnout, overwork, exhaustion, poor mental health, doing all-nighters is incredibly common among students to the point where we start to associate learning with misery. It's kind of taken as given that even PhD students who are passionate enough about a subject to study it in depth for four years end up hating their subject and hating academia by the time they finish their PhD. So instead of invigorating passion for the beauty of learning into students, we're essentially turning learning into a chore and grinding some of the most brilliant intellectual people into the ground. There are so many rigid boundaries within and between university that often end up being counterproductive. I've never understood why we were only allowed to pick one subject to study at university. When we're 18 years old, most of us don't have a clue what we want to study and most of us don't ever end up using our degrees in our workplaces anyway. So unless you're going into a specific profession like being a doctor, it feels like an unnecessary way of disallowing us the freedom to pursue what we're really curious about. Having such strict boundaries between disciplines also seems arbitrary since there was a time where some of these subjects didn't even exist. The first astronomers, the first chemists, composers had to convince their institutions that these subjects were worthy of being created. And finding people to think in one set way dictated by their discipline feels like a way of hemming in knowledge. Dr Jonas Salk, the guy who invented the polio vaccine, 
advocated for synthesizing the arts and sciences, including even music and philosophy together, but his ideas were largely shunned. But why? Studies have shown that scientists who study things like philosophy at the same time greatly improve their work as scientists. One subject benefits from the other. These strict boundaries between disciplines can also breed competition over collaboration as disciplines compete against each other for funding. And even when they do want to collaborate, dialogue is often very difficult because each discipline has its own way of doing things, its own way of writing, its own jargon. So a lot of the time they are not even able to effectively communicate. In the same way, there's very little collaboration between universities because each one of them is competing against each other for higher rankings, higher fundings, so they have very little incentive to help each other out. This makes innovation and the generation of new ideas incredibly difficult, not just because of the lack of collaboration, but also because this kind of competition breeds an environment where institutions, academics, disciplines are too afraid to experiment or try anything new because if they do and it fails, their rankings could plummet or their funding could reduce. In my experience, universities function as a pipeline to bullshit jobs. I have a vivid memory of attending a lecture where the professor said to us that just by virtue of sitting in that room, we were amongst the 2% most privileged people in the world, regardless of what our backgrounds were. And that really stuck with me. Given all of this privilege, we had more opportunities than the majority of the world's population to pursue creativity, curiosity, passion. Yet the majority of people that I know have been funneled into pointless, soulless, bullshit jobs, advertising, finance, corporate law. And this is no coincidence. The university grooms us for corporate life. Unis only accept students who got good grades in school, who made it clear that they are willing to submit to the system, those students who are seen as good risks to the established order. So they sieve out potential dissenters, disruptors. Universities get us to normalise boredom of lectures, reading and endless essays with no other purpose than to obtain a grade, training us to normalise boredom and a lack of fulfilment at work, Professors and students are burnt out, demoralised, overworked, bored, so we learn that to work is to suffer, preparing us to accept that in our workplace. Many professors use classes to enact rituals of control over students, so we accept workplace rituals of control. Professors begin to be seen as omnipotent, all-knowing beings, and students uncritically accept and regurgitate what they say, teaching us to uncritically accept the authority of bosses, doing what they want without agency of our own. Uni is sold to us as an experience, so students are framed as consumers, adding something to our personal brands. Oftentimes, we don't join things like clubs and societies out of the fun or joy of it. We join them so we can put them on our resumes so we can have advantage over other students. This then teaches us to accept capitalist consumerist values over personal enrichment. Then we leave university with masses of debt, making us more willing to accept shit jobs and get more exploited because we're so desperate to pay it off before the interest accumulates. All of this is just a perfect recipe for acceptance of bullshit jobs. We are always sold this meritocratic image that no matter what your background, if you work hard, you can go to university and you can get a good job. But in reality, universities just keep the people at the top at the top and the people at the bottom at the bottom. Richer parents can pay for private school education, private tutors, give their kids the best resources that help them get into the best unis. In the interview process, unis privilege students with social and cultural capital. In other words, do you know how to dress, what language to use, obscure art or Latin references of the elite? And are you even able to pay for uni? We do have loans in the UK, but most of them are not enough to cover the extortionate 
living expenses of things like student accommodation. Statistics consistently show that the most privileged people get into the most highest ranked universities and then occupy the most powerful positions in society. The UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson is a really good example of this. He went to the most expensive elite private school in the UK and then he went on to the most elite university. If he were working class and had gone to a state school, he'd probably be the local village idiot. But instead, he's now the most powerful man in the UK. Having been to a state school and coming from a more working class background, I definitely found it difficult to fit in at my universities where there was such a high percentage of privately school educated, richer kids. Do you not do humour at state school? What? You, you think we'd touch you with a barge pole? I found myself starting to assimilate to middle class ways of being, changing the way that I dressed, changing the way that I spoke. And if I felt like that, I can't imagine how it must feel for more marginalised people. Even when you're in universities, your ability to get good grades is largely dependent on your privilege. If you're going to university and simultaneously working two jobs to make ends meet, your experience is going to be very different from someone who's having their parents pay for everything and have all the free time in the world to focus on their studies. I also think you need to have a certain level of social and cultural capital to be able to understand what professors and academic articles are talking about. I can't tell you how many articles I read about liberating the working class that were written in such an inaccessible language that only the most elite people would be able to understand what it was talking about. And then there's also the whiteness of academia. In this part of the world, when we think of higher education historically, we tend to think of Plato's Academy, the Western Renaissance, perhaps the Prussian PhD system and the so-called Enlightenment, the triumph of rationalistic, apparently uniquely Western forms of thinking. These assumptions are so deeply ingrained that they usually no longer require stating explicitly, but are tacitly implied in educational discourse. As historical context is everything, a brief corrective is needed to this inaccurate and outdated, but incessantly regurgitated image. We can start by looking to the African father of medicine and architecture, Imhotep, who was designing stone-built skyscrapers at least 2,000 years before Plato's birth. Imhotep was a product of one of, if not the oldest, centralized education system on Earth. Schools that produce philosophy, copious literature, advanced mathematics, including the value for pi of 3.16, an understanding of golden ratio, and so-called Pythagorean geometry, Py Pythagoras studied in Egypt, sort of an academic joke. And of course, one of the great wonders <laughs> Uh, the pyramids at Giza all achieved a couple millennia before the intellectual birth of ancient Greece. Ancient Egypt slash Kemet's intellectual influence on Greece, though well established, is still seen as controversial in many academic circles for obvious reasons. Or we could glance at the Hindu and Buddhist systems of ancient India that were oftentimes free of charge and gave the world the decimal number system, the Pali Canon and the Vedas, and 2,500 years ago included women scholars or the Chinese Confucian system of education that produced paper, advanced shipping, printing, cannons, guns, not necessarily positive, but it did produce those things, and the compass all by the 11th century. Or we could venture among the Mexica and Aztec group that had compulsory education for all children of all social ranks and both genders as early as the 15th century. An education that included advanced learning in writing, astronomy, and theology. We could look beyond our materialist technological arrogance to the spiritual initiation systems countless in the indigenous groups that certainly constitutes an advanced body of knowledge, including the Dogon tribe of Mali in West Africa, whose understanding of the Sirius star system has puzzled anthropologists for generations. There are literally countless examples I could give if we care to look. Education is a human endeavor, not specific to one group or nation, despite the prevailing arrogance. That by now should be obvious. White supremacy and Western nationalistic sentiments across the centuries of recorded literature mean that what is considered classic, influential, or worth studying is overwhelmingly white. In the UK, at GCSE and A-level, many young people literally never study a single novelist of colour in their English classes. The concept of the literary canon, those books and authors deemed worthy of an elevated status, of being studied, of being called classics, is overwhelmingly informed by this biased worldview. 
and this worldview through history has only doubled down on the problem. The canon is mostly sequential. What is deemed worthy at the time informs and impacts what comes afterwards following literary movements. For much of history, the worthy and influential works were written by men, mostly middle class and assumed to be straight and almost definitely white. As I mentioned earlier, I always got the highest grades, but this wasn't in any way indicative of my intelligence. It was just because I would pick the subjects that I knew that I could do well in. I'd avoid risk, I'd avoid challenges, I'd avoid experimentation, and then I'd hyper-focus on the subject I would be graded on and neglect all the other topics. In hindsight, I definitely regret doing this, and I wish I had focused more on learning rather than grades, but it's really difficult not to when you know that your grades are going to determine the jobs that you get and how your life may pan out. We don't have to have grades. Research shows that grades have three effects. One, they make students less interested in whatever they're learning for a grade. Two, they become less likely to pick something more difficult. After all, if the point is to get an A, you're going to choose the shortest book or the easiest project because that makes it more likely you'll get the A. And three, when students are graded, they tend to do things in a more shallow or superficial fashion. They're less likely to really push and reflect and more likely to say, do we have to know this? Is this going to be on the test? That's why the best schools do not grade students and the best teachers do everything in their power to help students forget that grades exist. I think it is true that students who for all of their career have been told, this is going to be on the midterm, folks, or you better listen up, this counts for your grade, get the idea that that's the reason to do stuff, is to get a grade and don't bother doing stuff that isn't graded. It would be amazing if students were immune to that constant drumbeat. But the reality is, every time they think in terms of what am I going to do for a grade, they lose something as people and as learners. And so a teacher who has any sense of integrity and commitment to learning is going to spend most of his or her career trying to help students overcome this addiction. Not just by telling them, forget about the grade, but by making grades less and less relevant and important. So that the natural desire to do stuff that really provides a sense of satisfaction can be rediscovered by students who sometimes have forgotten what gives them pleasure. We have not just good theory, but good practice to show that the abolition of grades would do nothing but good. Grades often make professors less effective because they start teaching to the parameters of a test or an essay, and they often reduce students to a number or a letter rather than thoughtfully evaluating students as whole human beings. Instead of being intrinsically motivated to learn out of joy, we learn that the only reason to learn is for an external reward, like a grade or a job. So instead of us being encouraged to see learning as this exciting, beautiful part of life and a lifelong endeavor, many people will leave university never bothering to pick up another informative book ever again. When it comes to censorship, there are traditional forms of censorship, like the UK toying with the idea of getting rid of divisive woke subjects in schools and universities. These forms of censorship are a bit more self-explanatory, but what I'm interested in is the more subtle forms of censorship that are often less discussed. Most universities have a publish or perish mentality. Most professors are expected to constantly churn out more and more academic articles and books, otherwise they will be fired. And this leads to a situation where instead of taking the time to think about new ideas and to write things that really have value, most professors end up saying the same stuff that's already been said a million times before 
but in slightly different ways, just so that they can keep up with the constant need to continue to publish. Many of the most innovative, groundbreaking ideas take years to formulate and write about, but academics are too afraid a lot of the time to take the time or take the risk to work on these projects, to work on anything of real value, instead opting for saying the same things that have already been said many times before, but saying it in a slightly different way so that they can continue to churn out academic articles and keep their jobs. And I really don't blame academics for this because of course they want to keep their jobs. There's also a subtle censorship in the gatekeeping of academic journals deciding what is and isn't valid theory. Where fixed ideas have been, have been held in place by powerful intellects, by powerful figures in the field, figures who have the power to withdraw funding from other figures. Many of the world's greatest innovators and thinkers like Einstein were shunned by their academic communities because their ideas went against the grain. How many more Einsteins could we have if people weren't silenced for their ideas because of university gatekeeping? In Britain, you also have to describe the economic impact of the work that you want to conduct. This has meant that arts and social sciences and humanities are struggling to survive. There's also the censorship through fear of being sued. I had one ex-professor who was sued for writing a book about global environmental politics in which he outed many oil corporations and he was only able to republish that book once he removed all the parts about the oil corporations and after that he said it was devoid of everything that had initially made the book good and he's still struggling to pay off all of that debt now. And then there's also censorship through omission. It's not just about what we are being taught, it's also about what we're not being taught. And in my case, even though I studied global politics, international relations and anthropology, we rarely ever touched upon things like climate change, fascism, white supremacy, inequality, even though they would be incredibly relevant to the subjects that I studied. I think it's so important to ask ourselves what is the hidden curriculum of the education system? What are they teaching us without us recognizing that they're teaching it? So in my experience I found that so many underlying assumptions were taken for granted. For example, capitalism was taken as the only viable option for how we could organize our system. All other alternatives were never discussed, were never seen as worthy of consideration. Western ways of knowing were seen as the only viable, valid lens through which we could look at the world, so we didn't really take into consideration indigenous knowledge, non-human ways of knowing, learning from plants, values like endless consumption, endless growth and profit and progress were never questioned, they were just taken for granted without us being taught to think well, why is it that endless growth means planetary ruin? Students are mostly taught to theorise about the world rather than engage in it. We would talk about things like global politics from a godlike perspective, from a position of authority, as if we were reality's spectators or dictators rather than seeing ourselves as dynamically a part of the world. Teaching students to discuss global politics like war and terrorism and poverty from such a far removed intellectual theoretical standpoint teaches us to become desensitized to the very real impact that this stuff has on people's lives. Universities are really big on teaching critical thinking, which I think is great in many ways, but at the same time I think it leads to this critique mode where students are often constantly thinking about ways to tear down rather than thinking about ways to build up, rather than thinking about solutions or alternatives. Often this also means that when we listen to people, we don't listen to actually genuinely understand where they're coming from. We listen to respond. We listen in order to think, okay, how can I prove my intellectual dominance or superiority over you 
by proving how you're wrong. All of this combined means that a very fundamental element of the hidden curriculum of university is teaching us that the world is essentially unchangeable and that we have very little agency to change it. We're given a very limited vision of what the world is and what the world can be. The education system is not going to educate you to educate the people in power out of power. That's not what it's designed for. It's educated for you to keep society variously pretty much as it is. To be changed by ideas, to have our mind and world expanded by learning is, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful aspects of life. I think we should encourage the education system to be seen as a form of play, a form of joy, instead of submitting to one obligatory curriculum. We could follow in the footsteps of universities like the University of New Hampshire in the US and abolish grades and instead encourage self-motivated learning where students are free to explore what intrigues them, try one subject and they don't like that, okay, try another subject from a completely different discipline and basically being able to be free to learn at their own time, at their own pace, following their curiosity rather than following the strict dictation of a usually male white expert. Rather than professors teaching and students being taught Paulo Freire in Pedagogy of the Oppressed talked about creating an environment for mutual dialogue to happen where students and teachers could be together on an equal footing, having a conversation, deciding together how and what they want to learn and learning from each other rather than this strict hierarchy of the professor being all-knowing, omnipotent and the students being useless. Rather than our rigid, cerebral Western education system, we could learn from indigenous wisdom and bring about a holistic model of learning that emphasised learning in the mind, body and spirit. This could also involve music, dance, theatre, or as the author Bell Hooks wrote about in Teaching to Transgress, Classrooms could be a place to theorise from pain, exposing vulnerabilities, wounds, a place to laugh, cry, shout, rage, share stories, so that learning could enrich us, not just intellectually, but emotionally, psychologically, spiritually. That wonderful paragraph I talk about in Teaching to Transgress, that as teachers, we can know ecstasy in the classroom. So I want to give the props to every teacher in the public school that dares to defy and resist and bring the humanization into the classroom. To enhance innovation and idea generation, we could follow in the footsteps of so many EU universities and get rid of the ranking of universities and the ranking of departments and instead emphasize interdisciplinary and intercountry dialogue and exchange so that we can have collaboration over competition. Technology means that lectures and resources could be accessible to anyone from across the globe. So instead of this arbitrary idea that we study at 18 and then never again do we ever bother to learn, I think that we should foster an environment where people are able to freely access these resources online whenever they want so that they could study and learn at their own leisure. Education should include as wide a range of perspectives as possible, learning from non-humans, learning from plants, learning from indigenous perspectives, learning from non-Western perspectives so that people can make informed choices. I think we should also be encouraged to think about not only what are we learning, but also what are we unlearning. Not just what are we gaining, but also what do we need to give up. Instead of listening just to respond, I think we should be taught deep listening, cultivating genuine curiosity in different ideas, perspectives and people. Adrian Marie Brown posed the question, what would the world look like if we treated everyone as our teacher, even people that we disagreed with? 
Instead of teaching students just to theorize about the world rather than engage in it, I think we should teach students to be active participants in the world. And in practical terms, this could look like what the author Kathy N. Davidson in The New Education talked about when she said that in every one of her assignments that she ever gives at university, she always specifies that it has to have some real world application in terms of solving a real world problem. Paulo Freire emphasised education as the practice of freedom rather than keeping the top at the top and the bottom at the bottom. Education should be designed, formed and governed from below in the interests of the majority of the world's population. You know, knowledge was not just simply instrumental, it was crucial to understanding both the conditions of power and the effects of power. So meaning, I was no longer concerned simply about critical, critical thinking as a skill. I was concerned about critical consciousness as a way of getting kids to understand themselves, their relationship to others, and what it meant to act, actively change the world itself. And you could say, well, these are just the naive, idealistic aims of a young, radical girl. But is it? What is more absurd? What is more unrealistic? An education system that benefits only the elite, that extinguishes passion, that doesn't foster very good learning, that funnels people into pointless bullshit jobs, that does very little to solve many of the world's most pressing global problems. Or do we want an education system that is accessible to all, that is dedicated to bringing about the next generation of unique thinkers, innovators and creatives that are capable of transforming the world. If we were to ask the majority of the world what type of education they would want, how many people would really choose the former? Is it really so radical or absurd or unrealistic to suggest that the majority of the world's population should have some say in how and what they are taught to believe and in whose interests they're taught to believe it? For anyone currently at university or about to go to university, I definitely did not want to put you off. I would just encourage you to look into and get involved in the long history and tradition of student protest. And I also encourage you to think about what you are learning and what you aren't learning and the hidden curriculum of your university and to challenge your lectures and the union at your universities if you can to adopt more radical teaching methods. I would love to hear your thoughts and experiences around university and what you'd wished you'd learnt prior to going to university. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to me. I'd really appreciate if you could like, share and subscribe and consider becoming a patron to help me to continue to make videos. Thank you so much for all my patrons for making this video possible and thank you to James for editing this video.